All right. Um, so I, this is my first FOSDEM since 2010, I think was the last time I was here. Uh, I did a, a talk about building Firefox extensions called like Firefox Switchblade. But I, it probably should have been like Firefox foot gun because I was doing things like piping URL bar input directly into shell commands. Like, <laughs> so bad, so bad, but so much, so much fun. Uh, the good old days, ba battle days, sorry. Um, but uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit of a different story. The, the web is a little different since last time I was here. Uh, the, the needs of people that use it are a little bit uh, different. Uh, this last year I was working with a colleague on a project to look into like how can we bring some of these decentralization and distributed technologies into web browsers. I've worked on Firefox for a long time. I think landed my first feature in Firefox in 2006 or something like that. Um, and we did a little bit of exploration, both a little bit of code and experimentation, and I'll talk about that. Um, and also ran a series uh, introducing distributed and decentralized web projects on the Mozilla Hacks blog. So there's, I think, eight or nine different posts there uh, if you want to learn more. Um, but as we explored this area, this like looking at ways that we could change the web to meet the needs that we have, the most urgent needs right now, uh, a couple of interesting things happened. Like one, researching this project, I found about this project called Web3. I was like, okay, there's this whole group of people all kind of trying to build what they think is the next version of the web, right? Uh, they actually use a lot of the same language that the champions of the status quo web use and a lot of the same language that's even in Mozilla's mission. Uh, is fascinating. There's like almost no interaction or a crossover or a bridge between these different projects. Like these two different worlds. And one of them we have the web that kind of we've heard about today and a lot of the projects and speakers here. Uh, and this other group of people that are working on redefining what the web actually is in, in their vision. And not really a lot of kind of crosstalk between these projects. So uh, I wanted to learn more. So I pitched a talk for the Ethereum DevCon in Prague in November and got accepted for the five minutes on the developer stage. I was like, awesome. And then the week before, they were like, no, wait, wait. Uh, you have 30 minutes, and you're on the main stage. You're going after the CryptoKitties guy and before the Zcash guy. Okay, okay, all right. I will drop everything and make a better talk that I was planning on doing and try to take advantage of having this platform to speak to this community about our community that we've been part of for so long. Um, so I went and gave the talk. I met a bunch of people. It was interesting. But the real story was kind of the challenges that I encountered when telling people about this. I went to the Mozilla All Hands in Orlando, and I had this encounter where somebody was like, oh, I heard you went and spoke at the Ethereum conference. I was like, yeah, it was really interesting. And they were like, how do you feel about engaging in a community of criminals that are there solely to steal innocent people's money? <laughs> I, I, this is somebody I'd known for like 10 years. I mean, like, I, it was shocked. Like, Part of me was like really hurt, right? Um, this person kind of assumed the worst of my character for doing a talk there. I was like, I've been working on Firefox for like over a decade. What more must I do? <laughs> and, but also I was kind of shocked at the lack of curiosity about this whole other world that's moving forward, kind of whether, whether we agree with their architectural approaches, values, or purpose and intent or not. They're, they're doing it. So, uh, but kind of more shocking was in these types of discussions, for me, was there wasn't an ability to kind of have an open, open and honest conversation about the challenges that we have in the web today. Um, like one of the things that's always trotted out is, well, if you're using a blockchain, then you must be over engineering it. It doesn't matter what your use case is. I'm like, the, the web has, well, this number was wrong. It's like 9,500 estimated pieces of feature surface area right now. Uh, we're also, as if you're here for a Flocky's talk, we're shipping an assembly runtime inside of a desktop publishing format. Yep. If you want to talk about over-engineered. So like, we, we kind of have to, we have to have an open mind about the challenges that we face on, on the web. Another one is that it's not possible to design decentralized experiences. The UX just sucks on these projects. It always will, and they will fail because of it. And then you see, I don't know if anybody saw this, which is like this video of what it's like to use the web today. And it's everything from tracking, from anti-tracking stuff, or I see you're using an ad blocker. And you're like, no, I'm not. I'm just tra blocking tracking. I want to see your ad. You know, on and on. Sign up to my newsletter. It's just a horrible daily experience that a lot of people have that we really need to figure out a way to fix. 
Uh, we, we have our own design problems. Even though we have fantastic tools like CSS Grid, it does, for beautiful layouts, it doesn't mean that everybody's using them. A lot of people's data experience in the web is, is not great. Uh, and another one was like, well, everybody in, in that crypto world, they're just there for money. They're just there to figure out a way to get rich quick and get out. They're all bad actors. And I'm looking at the web today where we're like, okay, well, it looks like pretty soon 95% of the web will be one single for-profit company who decides the future and direction of that technology for money. So we need to be able to have this conversation about what the web needs. We actually need to be able to speak honestly about the challenges that we have and uh, the, the work that we need to do. Um, so this is Mark Sermon, the director of the Mozilla Foundation. And he did a talk, that, I don't know, 2009 or something like that. And he, he asked this question, like, uh, he did a couple of blog posts, I think, about it too. What does it take to build a 100-year organization? And this is kind of like burned in the back of my head. And every time I think about the, the future of the web and the technology decisions that we're making, I think about it in this context. How can we design things that are robust, especially in the face of these really extreme challenges that, that we have today? Um, in, in order to be able to have that conversation, in order for the web to be able to adapt and change, we, we need to be honest about the things that do need to change. Um, one of the challenges is uh, honestly the success of the web. It, there are estimated over 5 billion web pages, and web browser vendors have the job and the responsibility of making sure that they keep working, that you can go back to that web page from 1995 and it actually still renders and is, is usable. Uh, it, this makes change really difficult. Like this responsibility, combined with the complexity of the stack, means that making anything different there is a really, really slow process. And you have to be very, very careful. So there are good reasons why it's slow. But we also need to be able to understand when we need to make really, really important changes. Um, so it turns out, as we've found out in, this, in the course of this project over the last year, that some of the biggest champions of the web sometimes are actually the hardest to talk to about the things that actually need to change. Um, you know, one of the first things, like, we're, we're in love with URLs. We like, really are in love with URLs. And, uh, they do really serve an important purpose, but they also have some downsides, like cent centralization choke points and make it really easy. And just, just forget to pay your server bill and your website goes offline. And if you don't pay it again, it goes offline forever. And sure, the Internet Archive has maybe a copy, but like, do we really want to leave the robustness of the web and the history of our human activity on it up to one nonprofit organization, as awesome as they are? Um, it, it, it's really a problem. There's also... Uh, you know, censorship issues there. Uh, also, like if you talk to anybody uh, who's been a designer or a user researcher at a browser vendor, they will tell you that statistically, nobody understands how this stuff works. We understand how URLs work, because we work with them all the time, and we're technical, but most people do not. And th there's a challenge. So this is a famous video that, that Google did where they asked people, like Times Square or something like that, what's a browser? And just the, the unbelievable breadth of answers is, is fantastic. It's fantastic to watch. W well worth checking out. Um, uh, another one is like, we can't even imagine what, what a world would be like without, without domain names. Like, it's so embedded in our, uh, everything from how, all the different aspects and workflow, how we create products, uh, how we brand products and talk about them, how we talk to each other about how to find stuff online. Um, what, 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 if they go away, how do you even find anything anymore? It would be impossible. Uh, another one is, and this is, this is interesting too, is like this idea of that if you're talking about a network protocol, something at the protocol level, it must mean you, you are not user-centered. You've decided that the, the, to abandon the user, and you are really focusing on the wrong problem here. Um, they, needless to say, we're having these conversations over like, a, you know, many decades of development of internet architecture that is at the protocol level that allows all the benefits that we enjoy at the user level today. Um, forget that. Also, this, this photo is kind of mesmerizing. I could stare at this. I was like, I've been staring at this photo for like 10 minutes at one point. <laughs> look, look away. Um, so, so what do we need to change? Like, you know, like it's the browser, the way that browser, browsers have been a client basically for 20 plus years, right? Makes it really difficult for, from a, a security model standpoint, uh, just people, how people conceptualize the technology, the different patterns that we've developed around request response and things like this. Um, it makes it really difficult to make change. At, as we're seeing with things like HTTP3 and Quick and other things, there might be some change coming in that way either way. Um, but it's a really well-known and well-understood model that also has some problems. Uh, uh, all the decision-making power basically is on one side of it, and that's on the server. 
The decision that I have as a user, of a, a using my user agent, as it were, a browser, is I could choose which websites to go to. But I don't have a choice of, do I get to see it again later, right? Um, or I like that design, but now it's changed. And these are the examples of like, people have really visceral emotional responses to change. You find a website, even somebody like you really like and they update their blog and you're like, well, I like the old design better, right? Like there's these little just like annoyances, but we have really strong emotional attachments to how things look and how website changing over time is maybe not something that is enjoyable for some people. It would be great if I could just look at the way you had it before. Um, and another one is uh, kind of people are concerned about putting stuff online because of the legal repercussions of doing so. Uh, Anil Dash had a massive set of samples of print samples, and they're all well within the fair use length. But he was scared to put them online because he was like, I, I'm going to get sued either way. Uh, it doesn't matter if the suit has merit or not. Um, this, this is another one. The centralization of how websites work today means that services that we depend on, as long as they are residing in, and all the application logic resides entirely on the server, when that company decides to sell to a bigger fish or something like that, that server just goes poof, goes away. And the thing that you maybe, maybe have, in this case, like built your business on also goes away. Uh, other things like the whole, whole chunks of the internet going down due to some centralization choke points. There are a variety of reasons for this, right? But um, I'm going to talk about some projects that are trying to figure out creative approaches for working around it. Uh, and this is really a really important one. Uh, I lived in Thailand for a year, and it was amazing how uh, sometimes they have, they have a pretty strong censorship regime there and some laws around that, uh, but the software is actually like, pretty terrible. So it meant that sometimes like, the page, the Wikipedia page, for the king of Thailand would actually be available, and then other times it just wouldn't. And you would just see this, and all kinds of other pages too, because they didn't have really sophisticated algorithms that they were using. They were using a really blunt tool to be able to block access to information. And uh, as we've seen, especially in the last couple of years, the increase, the rise of internet shutdowns for whole nation states. Um, really, like DNS and central client server uh, network interactions, as we're very used to on the web, is incredibly easy to completely shut off people's access to information. I was also in Turkey for a month in November, and just uh, living in a place where Wikipedia is banned was, was fascinating. There was like spray paint on the walls of Wikipedia pages where people had stenciled, stenciled Wikipedia pages. It was awesome. Um, but, but these are real problems that we need to figure out. And there are a couple of projects that are figuring this out. They're experimenting in what distributed web might look like, what decentralized web might look like. I'm not going to talk about any of these really in depth. This is more about the challenges that we have as a community right now who are building the web and using the web and love the web in making change. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we approach that change inside browser vendors and a couple of different experiments that people have done. But these are some of the projects that are kind of trying to redefine what the web would look like in a way that gives a little bit more of that power onto the user so that we can actually get to the point where the user agent isn't just a place where we can request stuff, but has actually a little bit more decision-making power. Um, when we started looking at how we could add some of these technologies into web browsers, we're like, okay, there's really, you know, like each one of these projects has different architectural approaches. They have different philosophies about things like, uh, you know, P2P networks and uh, blockchain or no blockchain. There's all, all different types of use cases they are trying to address, maybe first rather than later. Some of them are, are, are more general purpose and sometimes not. Uh, there's a whole bunch of like higher level application primitives that you find in P2P and distributed and decentralized applications, uh, blockchains and swarms and CRDTs. Uh, things like key management are really important and really difficult. Uh, but when we looked at these types of projects, a lot of these similar key higher level architectural pieces came to the fore. Uh, okay, well, should we just make like a navigator.blockchain API? It's probably maybe not the right level of abstraction that we want. Um, so we we're like, okay, what are, what are some of the lower level primitives even before those that are enabling these people to build these types of architectures? And it turns out, really kind of well-known set of technologies that are kind of boring, but when put together in kind of simple ways, enable all these other different higher level application primitives. Um, but none of these are, are in the web today. They're not, not shipping really in a meaningful way in, in any major web browser. There's been experiments, there's been attempts, 
There's been some like, pushing forward and then pulling back, uh, both by Chrome, both by Firefox, Opera. Um, and, but it's, it's still not there, for, and for a variety of reasons. Like I said before, change is really hard. Uh, there's also like, real security concerns about this kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, these, these use cases that get unlocked by these means that we need to start figuring out what that security model looks like, and we need to be able to understand the trade-offs that we're making by not adding these types of functionalities and giving more decision-making power to users in some cases. Uh, so there are a couple different ways that, as people who make browsers, we looked at where, okay, we're like, where do we put this technology? Do we put it in the web pages, APIs there? We could make extension APIs, which then it's not kind of there by default. So the developers may or may not use it, and the users don't know to install it, and we already know well understood problems with extension and install flows. Uh, we could add it as a core browser feature. It's like, okay, as a browser, just add, add IPFS as a native protocol or something like that, right? So there's these decisions kind of like, what a, I don't know, choice of venue kind of decisions about. And they all have their pros and cons. Um, you know, a, a JavaScript API for, for raw TCP socket access has been tried. And I think you can, you can even flip it on in, in Chrome OS and Chrome Apps there. Uh, there's a couple of places where you can get it work, and Firefox OS devices had access to it. But there, there really were a lot of problems, and, and it, it wasn't maybe the right level of abstraction. Uh, so we worked on a project called LibDWeb, uh, my colleague Arakli and I, where we implemented that set of technologies, these, most, most of these anyway, in web extension APIs. So you could write a browser extension that was able to open up a listening socket. Um, this unlocked really a lot of use cases. They were just experimental APIs, and we were having conversations about how we actually get to the point where we can ship it, uh, at least even in nightly, off by default, right? A place we at least let people experiment. Um, one of the coolest things that happened almost right away was somebody from the IPFS project ported IPFS to use these APIs and, and actually did a demo serving up Wikipedia, Turkish Wikipedia, in a P2P way, which meant that it was really, really difficult for the government there to be able to censor it. And this was kind of an immediate validation that there is something, something worth doing here, that it's worth taking some risks to figure out how we can change the nature of what a user agent is to actually really represent the user's needs more instead of the server owner's needs more. Uh, so we, we, got, we got kind of far. We, we got at least some buy-in from the teams and shipping the APIs that they were interested. Uh, we started going through the threat modeling exercise for things like opening up listening sockets on, a, on a, something that's been a client for 20 odd years. Uh, those are conversations ongoing. Um, but, but, you know, there, there really is a level of interest. And um, we even poked, uh, you know, poked a little bit at, like, okay, well, if um, I think Andre Garcia landed a patch in Firefox that enabled some of these distributed web project protocols to be loaded, at least, like, forward to a different page or URL in the browser. And a few months later, Chrome also whitelisted those protocols. So, so this kind of, like, slow pushing little bit by little bit in the space um, that was really interesting to see. Uh, the, going back to other kind of choice of venue decisions, um, there's some interesting work happening in IPFS, and Heracles also involved in that project, to kind of figure out like, how close can we get using existing web APIs to either connecting to a local IPFS node, uh, or even how close we get to even hosting some kind of node, um, or connecting to local DHD, things like this, really pushing it, okay, how many browsers have inter, you know, uh, say, uh, implemented service workers, shared workers, and how can we, and WebRTC, and how can we combine this stack into a really kind of scary, overcomplicated ball that eventually does meet some of these needs, right? Or at least connect to some of these networks in a way that reduces the frictions in getting more people to actually be able to use them without having to, say, install browser extensions and things like that. So that's the kind of like, what can we do in a web page today approach? Um, and then also, like Brave Browser, they're like, maybe we'll just implement IPFS natively. They already shipped a cryptocurrency wallet. So their user base is small enough that they're able to push really hard, uh, take more risks, maybe not have to worry about kind of like the uh, compatibility backlash that if Firefox did something like that and we're like, ah, oh, it didn't work out. Like it's really hard to walk back from web features that you ship in a browser that you then need to basically own forever so that like I said at the beginning, you don't break the web, 
which is kind of like first do no harm for people who are actually making the web. Um, so that's at the core level, where you, there are different ways to do it. No, none of these are really the right answer that we know yet, but there's a lot of experimentation happening. And one of the things that I think is important about all this is like we didn't come up with, okay, we're not like, okay, the web extension APIs is the way to do this. Is that best balance of security, compromise, compromising the security stuff there with the user needs that we, that we need? Not really. We didn't even have a plan to ever ship it. Part of the why we actually did that project was to kind of initiate this conversation, to push on the boundaries of the space uh, so that we could actually get people talking, at least, about that kind of security model. Uh, we're also looking at starting up a W3C community group, so there's a kind of a place where all these projects can speak in a way that might put us on the path towards some types of standardization or at least shared implementations and interoperable implementations of stuff like this in, in web browsers. Um, but coming back to this point, we, we need to be able to figure out what that change is going to be. We don't maybe know what the end state is going to be, but as you saw in the beginning of the slides, and you're all pretty much aware, as like, especially if you're hanging out, listening to some of the projects talking about anti-tracking stuff in the privacy and decentralization room over there, the web has real challenges today uh, that, to some extent, might be considered compromised even in some ways, especially depending on what web properties you're visiting. Uh, the Privacy International report about how, uh, uh, how basically how many people on the web and even native apps are subject to tracking was, was really horrifying and something that we need to take seriously and really take immediate and drastic action to be able to do. The companies that are doing this for a profit have relatively little incentive to be able to do it. But in open source communities like this, we already have the values. We know what we want to see, but we need to be able to push on that environment to make, make that change happen, even when it's kind of like tearing at our hearts to say, okay, maybe we, maybe we need to revisit what a URL means. Maybe we need to think about what a, what a browser looks like, and even if there are relative security concerns, understand what the threat model of those, is, of, of those are going to be so that we can actually figure out what that next user agent is going to look like. Um, and hopefully the web then will still be here in 100 years. Thanks. Six minutes for questions. Yeah. Okay, so apparently, like open glass socket. Ah, do we have a microphone? Yeah. Ah. Thank you. So apparently, opening raw sockets. Uh, to extension mm -hmm. develop developers, it's like pretty hot uh, topic, and I noticed this when there was like the drop of the old extension format and the switch to the new one. We had like extensions like uh, Fire FTP, which used this feature. Yep. And my question is, if you were to open in a web extension way, not in the legacy way, in a new modern way, these sockets, what sorts of threats are you afraid of? And both as a client as, and as a server, because IPFS would be as a server, I guess. Yeah, um, so it, it's a really good question. That's part of what we started to get into when we started doing the threat modeling of these types of APIs. We only fully went through the process for the protocol registration API. We haven't yet gotten to the sockets APIs. But it, the, the upside there is that uh, Chrome's been shipping those APIs on Chrome OS for quite a while. So there are people who have actually shipped these APIs in production to some sets of users. So there are public discussions. And on the, uh, hmm, there are so many different repos for standardization. On <laughs> W3C or the WICG or the what WG, or one of them, there's a really great thread about exactly that, what the threat model for listening sockets are. So I'll, I'll try to look it up and then just share it on Twitter or something like that. Uh, but it, it, it kind of depends. And this is one of the reasons why the web takes a really conservative view towards opening up these types of capabilities because it's serving the entire needs of humanity every day so that that kind of attack surface is really broad and understanding what that threat model is end up being ends up being really kind of subjective to the kind of places that you go on the web but i think for certain groups of people it's worth evaluating what the trade off is and that that i think is what ultimately needs to happen there Any other question? Yeah. 
Hi, um, talking about uh, we look at uh, URL again, like a uh, mask. So I'm just wondering, what's in your mind, you know, what kind of aspects we need to look into? I understand that the W3C is looking at like a uh, decentralized ID working group, yeah. So how these two work together, what's your thoughts about it? Uh, so I'm not, I'm not super familiar with the, the DID spec, the decentralized identification spec. Uh, but as far as a, a kind of like post URL life, the, some of these projects here have done a lot of experimentation in there. So um, uh, they're, the examples so far, like IPFS, you open up what is basically a hash, and the DAT project is really similar. Uh, I was at the Aragon conference earlier this week in Berlin. And there was a designer there who did a kind of a cool presentation on like uh, the ways that you can tie hashes and all these different in different types of projects to real names and things like that, and different design patterns and interaction patterns for tying some type of information that you can find to those. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of design challenges around losing the URL, um, but the, the problems we're going to have to figure out sooner or later. Uh, and it also doesn't mean the URL is going to go away forever, right? Like, we still want to have access to the type of publishing workflows and tools that we have today when they are available. But we also have to balance that against preparing and being ready for conditions maybe when they're, when they're not. But I, I honestly, I, I, I started looking through all the decentralized ID stuff, and it's a really, it's a deep stack. <laughs> so I, I'm not really super familiar with it. Cool. Uh, thanks. That was a really interesting talk there. But uh, what I was wondering there, do you think there'll be a pushback from like the certain companies there that decentralized way is how they make money? Like, will they, Do you think they'll be able to survive in this whole decentralized way? They might not be. Yeah, that, that's a really valid question when 95% of web users might be using an engine that is controlled by one company. <laughs> yes, I, 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 just to some extent, you could look at that that near monopolization of that space as that pushback. Like, what, what, do they, what do they have to push back about when they already own the ground we walk on and the air we breathe? That's that's the threat. I think that's why why kind of I talked about the social challenges that for as much as we love the web, we need to explore different ways that the web might exist. We need to look at all the different permutations that might be that it might turn into in ways that help us push back <laughs> against those people who don't want us to have more user agency. I think that the company has already pushed back. They, they, own, they own almost every moment of our waking day. Any other question? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.